Hello and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today I am hugely excited because this is an episode that's been in the making for a couple of years now. Been trying and pestering him to get him on the show. Uh, and finally, he is here, Mr. Simon Maisie of Twelve Trade Web. How are you? I'm great, thank you, Toby. It's very exciting to be here. Listen, it's, uh, it's, it's great to have you on. Loads and loads to talk about and unpack today, um, but let's kick off with a little bit about yourself and TradeWeb. Tell us about TradeWeb first and foremost. Yeah, thanks. So Tra TradeWeb, for those who don't know TradeWeb, we're an, a regulated electronic trading platform. We provide electronic trading solutions to our clients, which are about kind of two and a half thousand asset managers, banks, central banks, hedge funds. And what we try and do is like improve, help them execute their trade in an efficient kind of straight through processed way. So really kind of helping them like uh, optimize how they're doing their execution. Trading over now, it's an amazing number of trading almost a trillion a day now and uh, a multi-asset. So we st trade have started about 20 years ago in US treasuries and expanded into Europe, into Asia. Uh, adding more and more government bonds, then adding corporate bonds, then expanded into derivatives, interest rate swaps, credit default swaps, then into ETFs and equity derivatives. So we're trying to provide our clients a kind of solution that they can really leverage in, in terms of their trading activity. It's a business that's, uh, that's scaled and scaled and, and, and uh, one, as you say, that's, that's sort of just gone into so many different angles and, and avenues of, you know, on a global basis. I love your sort of story about how you sort of came to, to be with it. Give us a bit of background about your um, your story, the Simon Maisie story, as some might call it. So I started in finance. I, I was an engineer originally, but I joined in finance to join uh, what was Chase before the Chase JP Morgan merger in 1998. And, and I was at JP Morgan for 16 years, variety of roles as the business evolved from a kind of, C, in kind of COO type roles. And then the last part of my time there was looking after the electronic trading business for the global rates business of JP Morgan. So obviously through that, a lot of, and, and as e-commerce became more and more important as, as kind of uh, part of the way JP Morgan was doing business, then the kind of, that also led to the kind of the rise of TradeWeb as well. So part of my job was interacting with TradeWeb and the people working out what we were doing. And, uh, and then also I was kind of the, the at that point TradeWeb was a, uh, formed and owned by a consortium of banks. So I also sat on the board, got to know the company well, and, and that's kind of how then I ended up joining the company to come and kind of focus on what I was then doing at JP Morgan, but just for trade rev and focus solely on that. What was it about that? I mean, it's, it, I love that sort of story. I think it's really, you know, I wouldn't say it's unique, but it's certainly an unusual story to sort of speak, yes, you know, so it's to sit on the board through that. And so almost like Victor Kayam, like the company so much you bought it, you know, to, 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 uh, to, you know, to sit there and see it. What was it that sort of really you know, prompted that move for you? Because it's a big move. It's a big change in, in that sort of thing. And, and it, there's obviously something there that was so compelling as a draw to bring you into you know, to that from a, you know, a good, secure, big, you know, big position into this, this opportunity. What, what, what drove that? Well, I, I didn't buy trade web. It might have been great. <laughs> <if I had that. laughs> but I think what, what I was interested in doing is like that. I was increasingly focused just on electronic trading as my role within JP Morgan. So I think that going to, as I, as I mentioned, like the electronic trading was coming more and more important. You could see that it was like the, the, there was so, a number of drivers towards that electronification that we've seen across all markets. And I think some of those are just the kind of efficiency about doing business the kind of regulatory changes pushing that pushing more towards that and then and, and the kind of availability of technology so it's kind of seeing that trend and then that's what i was doing i kind of thought like it would be great to really just focus just on that to go and work somewhere where that's all they do rather than it's just part of what they do i've been interacting with trade about kind of really like the company and the people here you could see it was on a really great growth trajectory and i think the advantage of trade with that kind of network then gives you the kind of the network trade of having its own technology, the kind of really great people there gives you the kind of the ability to kind of work with clients to kind of do more and solve more things. I think that to me, it just felt like trade of was a, a company really kind of doing new and exciting things that uh, like I wanted to be part of. And, and talk to me about being what being a part of it means. Talk to us about your role now, what it entails and, and uh, how you're making that change. So my role is uh, I'm, I'm responsible for the global corporate development team at TradeRev, which is really is kind of how does TradeRev keep growing, thinking about what's happening in market structure and the trends, what does that mean for our clients, what should we be doing, 
yeah, like how we do new things, so adding whether we're adding new products or we're doing partnerships or acquisitions. And the partnerships have really been a core part of how Trade Jobs grow. And we talk about this, a culture of collaborative innovation, which is kind of really rather than being this kind of disruptive fintech uh, developer, we, we kind of collaborate with our clients. We want to work with them about how they do their business, how we can help them make that more efficient, uh, kind of help, help them to kind of develop, but not, not kind of disrupt what they're doing. I love that idea of a, a culture of collaborative innovation. We were talking about this a little bit beforehand about the sort of changing face of, of, of the industry. Dive into that a little bit more for me. So, so where was the strategy behind that? And how does, you know, when you talk about you know, there and, and you know, defining new areas and moving into it, what's the thought process about making those, those areas and those collaborations and those partnerships? What drives that? So I think it's kind of, that's kind of always been a big part of trade. It started from where TradeUp came from as this consortium of banks. So working with the banks to, to help them reach their clients. The core part of our business is the kind of buy side clients seeking liquidity from the kind of sell side. And so that's kind of how TradeUp started. And that's kind of been ingrained in the culture, but also then like then the speaking to clients, kind of understanding how they do business, how how we can deploy our technology to help them. In terms of your, your, your sort of decisions about where it goes and, and what sort of business areas and products and, and geographies to expand into, we spoke about you know, TradeWeb now being, you know, changing into, into you know, numerous different areas of Europe and into you know, Asia and, and it's, it's obviously strength in the States, et cetera. Tell me a little bit about your, 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 how, you, how that focus comes about and how you work out, you know, I guess, the growth and the future of the business. Yeah, so like we're a network business, so we're kind of always ways we can expand the network. So the, what are the things we can do, the products we can add, the protocols we can develop, or the kind of sophistication around how we do things that makes our solution relevant for more people and more of their business. I think we're seeing this trend of multi-asset, cross-asset trading. So, so the kind of desks trading more things trading one product against another product, kind of linkages between products increasing over time. And, and I think there's a, both a regulatory trend and a kind of cost efficiency pressure trend towards that point. So I think for us, the, how, can we, how can we help the network of clients we already have? How can we leverage the technology and the integration into their systems and their processes to do more for them? And that's kind of really how we're thinking about how do we keep expanding? I th and I think there's an angle of, you know, finding new client segments or new geographies, also finding new products, but then also finding, you know, increasingly sophisticated protocols within those products that clients want. So, so oh, I'm, I'm using trade to trade like this, but I still have this other business that I have to do another way for some reason. Like, can you help me with that? So I, I a good example there in the last, a uh, couple of years we had of like portfolio trading rolling that out of like enabling clients to do like an increasingly large list of trades in one go i think this is really interesting isn't it because the, the, the bit that i picked out there from of specific interest to what you just said was was about being driven by how we can make our you know, how we can improve our relationship with our customers and make them better and, and and if i'm to look at the last two years in particular speaking to people on this show every single week one of the core themes has just been, you know, work, work in, you know, walk in the customer's shoes and look through their lens and say, how can we improve their, their position, which is the catalyst for growth for so many businesses that we've seen, you know, do really well over the last couple of years in particular, where I think that's been put in the, uh, you know, really in the forefront of everything that we've been doing. And it's also looking at trends, right? There's, there's a number of different things that are, that are happening in the market all the time. I think that this, the, the scale of evolution has been happening, you know, ever quicker. One of those trends, um, you know, quite rightly, that we've seen at the moment is ESG. I know you're uh, chairing the ESG steering committee at, at, at the moment. Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing there. Yeah, so, and so you know, I'm the chair of our ESG steering committee, which really is kind of like making sure we're organised around this and kind of focused on the right things. And, and a large part of ESG is, is actually just articulating what we're doing. There's a kind of greater demand for kind of more information about the impacts that the companies had. And uh, so I think that the, the way we think about, so I think that there's one, there's, a, there's a, a trend towards like people are more focused on sustainability. It's not just about returns anymore, but it's about like the difference people can make both in their own lives, in like the, 
companies that they use or support, but also in like how they make their investments as well. Mm. The people are focused on, okay, what is the impact of these things? And I think one really interesting thing is kind of through the pandemic, there was obviously a whole load of other things happened, some really kind of important shift of focus for people. And you might've thought this, this focus like uh, is not that critical. People be focused on other things like survival, keeping your job, keeping your family safe, but actually kind of really accelerated through the pandemic. It kind of, the pandemic highlighted the impact we as individuals and as companies have on, on the kind of our environments around us and both the kind of the actual environment, but also the communities we're operating in. And so I think they've kind of really helped accelerate that focus. So that, and, and we've seen like the, this just more and more from our clients asking us about this and how we can help them. So there's really kind of three things that we've been focused on as trade rep. And what one is, what do we need to do as a company? And that really is not a, like a big change in anything we do, but it really is just better articulating that out there to the our stakeholders. It's something we know our employees really care about. We, we've, we have set up a working, there's so much demand for people to get involved and help and focus on this. We have an internal working group really of a lot of people focused on this. And so it's kind of articulating like what is our energy usage? How are we focused on reducing that or increasing like renewable energy usage in our data centers, for example? But also like what, what is our kind of how do we think about kind of social issues? What is our diversity statistics? How are we improving access to our industry and the kind of a better balance and mix of employees within the company? So putting that information out, there was obviously something we were already focused on and doing, but now there's kind of a demand to have that information out there, hold ourselves accountable for it. So that's kind of one stream of things we're doing. And uh, as part of that, we put out our first ever corporate sustainability report last year really kind of to, to show these things and to show how we think about impact on communities and where we think we can make a difference and then the second stream is we can think about what we do as an electronic trading platform seeing all of this volume like what are we actually seeing there so we've started publishing our volume of uh, for instance green bonds to show like this this is where the focus is this is what the impact's having and so the in the last year that our volume of green bonds being traded through trader went up 75%, like a massive increase in demand for these green bonds, way above both the issuance of green bonds, but also the kind of general market growth as well. And really that just kind of shows you the, the demand from investors for to understand where their money's going, what it's being used for, and to, and to, to kind of push to make a difference on that. So we publish our volumes, we look at things like the by sell ratios of those bonds or the what's called the greenium or the premium of a green bond over a non-green bond and, and you can see there again the kind of the extra demand for these instruments so for instance if you take the the easiest one to look at is the german government has been a big issue of green bonds they issue a 10-year government bond and an exact pair of a green bond with the same maturity and the, the, you can see there's a premium in the yield. Investors are prepared to pay more for the green bond. And given German government bonds are yielding like a, a pretty much close to zero, there's now like a six basis point premium for the green bond, which is pretty amazing. And that's kind of only been kind of issued maybe 18 months ago and kind of it's wow. expanded out to that point. So that's kind of that what we call kind of shining a light on what we're seeing. And then the, the third part is kind of back to the core of trade of like, how can we help our clients? What, what do they want to do about kind of ESG and sustainability? So we've been looking at things like we highlight now green bonds on our GUI. And so the client can see this is a green bond, this isn't. We provide like reporting for clients stripping out their activity in green bonds versus non-green bonds. We're kind of increasingly seeing more granularity that people want to see there's green bonds, blue bonds, social bonds, pandemic bonds, kind of sustainability linked investments. We're kind of seeing this kind of increasing need for granularity about what people are trading and how they're trading. It's incredible, isn't it? And, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's so good to see first, first and foremost, but it's also um, the fact it's being driven, you know, driven so much by, you know, doing the right thing as a business, but also by the, you know, the clients and what you're seeing in the marketplace and responding, you know, responding to that. I'm really interested about what you say there about the, the pandemic and, and how that sort of uh, increased, you know, increased the focus on this. 
why do you think that was you know i mean it, it changed you know it changed a lot of people's thinking in various areas and you're quite right that you think right it, you know does survival mode kick in do everyone it, does everyone become a lot more selfish because of this but it seems to have had almost the the, the opposite effect doesn't it what's driven that I, th I think there's been a few drives. I think one, there's, there is a, maybe more like a generational change that's happening as well. That like the, and we, we see that within the company of like the, our, the younger generation, our employees kind of really focused and care about this. And they care about e even down to things like the reusable uh, things in, our, in the kitchen, in the office. You know, those mm -hmm. kind of things you kind of think like people really care about that stuff. And it feels like you know, like fairly low level, but like that, that matters and, and we want, people want to change those and, and looking at the corporate gifts we have and making sure they're recyclable and, and all of those things, I think that mm. will care. And people kind of see the kind of increasingly globalized world of like the impact you have and the impact on the whole world that that's having. And you kind of, I think the pandemic and like something that started in one place and then spread so quickly and you really can't isolate yourself from the rest of the world. So reusable, reusable stress toys at Trade Tech this year then, is it? <laughs> also, I think you move, you move to, uh, one of the things we did was like uh, no more kind of corporate Christmas gifts, but we'll kind of donate to charity. Yeah. And I, I think another like thing that I think is like really exciting about the way we do trade was also had like a, a philanthropic part of trade web that we've called trade of cares and we've been focused on supporting charities that matter to us and matter to our employees. But increasingly we're kind of being asked about that more broadly by other stakeholders, by our clients or investors. And uh, one of the things that I think is really exciting is, is it's not just about like the money we can give. And obviously that's important These charities need funds to be able to kind of pursue their causes, but also are there other ways we can help? So, and there's, there's two charities that I think are kind of really exciting that we've started supporting. So one is the one called the Cowrie Foundation which is about supporting kind of British black students through university and helping provide funding for them. And that's something that trade has got involved in, in the, in the last few months. And for us, it's not just about providing funding to help with their fees and through university, but then also can we help them with mentoring and then maybe internship job offering job yeah. offering afterwards. And so really how can we kind of change the kind of uh, inclusiveness and, and the kind of diversity balance of the, our industry and, and our company and kind of how we can do things like that to help them. There's been massive growth, I think, in, in ESG and its significance over the last couple, couple of years. What's, what's, what's next for it? How does it continue to evolve? What, what, do, you, what do you see as, as, as you know, the next steps and the next trends that we can look for you know, with it, within this? I think the focus is just going to continue to increase. We can see that the number of clients and investors and the our board focus on this you can you can feel that that's just going to continue increasing and we're nowhere near at kind of maturity yet but i think as, as it starts to mature i think a couple of things will happen so first is we're getting more granularity so so as i mentioned like more granularity on different types of instruments and investments but more granularity about what esg means so we, we get rated by ratings agencies and we have an ESG score. But I think people are increasingly starting to say, okay, I don't just want the total score. I want to understand the E part of that, the S part and the G part. And really understand like within those, what, what are you doing? What, where are you on each of those? So I think that granularity uh, will increase. And I th also I think the, the kind of people, there will be more kind of standardized people are going to say, okay, I understand this is a green bomb, but actually what does that mean? And you're going to get like sort of more scrutiny on, on, on what does that mean? Is this really green? It is like, and so this obviously a debate at the moment is nuclear power environmentally friendly or not. And like, I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think that sort of question is going to come out more and more and people looking at, okay, where are these labels come, coming from? So one of the things we did was um, really early on when we realized clients wanted to see these labels and understand what different instruments were as we partnered with a, a non-profit called the climate bond initiative who are doing this kind of scrutiny over what is a green bond and what's not and so we use their labels to display on trader rather than having just having to come up with them ourselves or taking them from another source so i think there's going to be more and more of this kind of industry development of what do different in instruments or or kind of investments mean you're kind of seeing more regulation coming on this now the, the european union introduced this 
sustainable finance disclosure regulation of like when you when you launch an investment fund of like really kind of if you say this an ESG fund okay what does that mean what do you what actually how does that drive decisions within the investment fund? what are you investing in so I think there's there's going to be more scrutiny around that which, which is going to be a really healthy thing it's amazing isn't it and, and, and it's so good to see that that sort of stuff taking um you know taking shape to see you guys you know putting the committees together and, and helping people you know you grow that and articulate it and you know i, I, I think you know, when you call it a trend it's almost that downplaying the significance of, of what it is this is going to be a big you know focus of of you know the, the future growth and sustainability of the financial technology space full stop hasn't it yeah let's, let's i think move... it, i agree it's Sorry. probably not like a trend it's uh, it's like a shift rather than yeah a trend. yeah yeah that that's and that's um yeah that's strong to see. and i think if we look into 2022 and we look forward um at the start of the, the year as we are now into some you know, things that we will see gather more and more significance across the industry esg is definitely going to be at the kernel of, of all that it's you know something which we're seeing more and more we're reading more and more people are putting more and more into the, the sort of forefront of their, of their boardrooms what else do you think will be some of the things that we should, that we can look for and expect in the financial technology space this year beyond esg beyond esg yeah I, th I think um, this, we were chatting a minute ago about this, just this kind of the, the level of innovation, I think, is really accelerating. I think there's, there's more access to capital, there's more access to technology, new technologies coming. There's kind of a, like a focus on like, w we can do more things. So like you don't have to, you know, we can find, rather than just accepting how things work, we can find new efficiencies, new ways of doing stuff. And, uh, more openness to kind of new providers in in special areas so i think there's going to just be a a kind of continuing acceleration in kind of the level of innovation and uh, obviously a trade of that's something we're focused on of like the need to sort of continuously innovate not stand still kind of really kind of our clients are demanding more things from us so mm. i think that's going to carry on and, and as well i think this this kind of push for uh, increasing regulation on on how things work and how, and how things should be done and, and like uh, improving the kind of way markets operate I think it's going to continue and then and maybe as part of that this kind of cost focus as well of like just just being more efficient and I think that's kind of the exciting thing for, for trade web is all of those things feel like really good trends for us it's deeply embedded into you know sort of DNA of the business, isn't it? When you think when you think about one of those, and I absolutely agree with you. I think you know particularly I think with that you know regulation side of the, the sort of you know genuine asset class that is now crypto, it'd be really interesting to see what you know sort of comes in into there as well. I also think it's very interesting you, you, know, you talked there about the collaborative and and efficient uh, based thing we were talking beforehand about. Yeah, the sort of enterprise systems as were, uh, in, you know, particularly in, in the capital markets, where it would be one thing does all, you can't have anything else that goes into it, and you just have to learn to adapt towards that. The trend I've, I've seen over the last couple of years, and, and you mentioned before about the sort of expectations and demands of clients increasing all the, all the time, that's the digital digital world, right? As we're used to get, getting more and more coming directly out of your phone and instant gratification in every aspect of life, it comes through the expectations rise. And with that, we have to be more innovative. And someone sat there, you know, in front of a, a, an enterprise system and, and saying, you know, legacy system saying this has to do everything isn't accepted anymore. It's how can this part of my job be improved? How can I, how can I look for those things driven by cost, driven by time, driven by demand, driven by clients and driven by, in my opinion, a, you know, a digital culture, which is, you know, which, which is centered around instant gratification and, and ability and access to get everything as, as quickly as possible and, and i love the fact that you guys are thinking about that and sort of wiring it into you know, how can we be ahead of the curve in in delivering that through to us through, through to our customers yeah and i think the other part of that is that to the kind of the automation electronic trading and how it's just like reach like the if you imagine like on when you're trading on the phone you you have a limit to the number of people you can call to try and find what you want to trade try and find like the liquidity or the best price and obviously on the electronic trading that that reach is just way bigger and then not only like just the, the reach you can have and the, the the kind of ability to access more and more people and find the best price find out where the bond you want is but then also then when you when you've traded it everything else just to happen you don't have to worry about 
in the old days of writing a ticket and faxing it and then someone else having to type it into one system and then another mm. system like all of that stuff can just happen and i think that one of the things we've seen especially in europe and and we're kind of seeing this more and more now is around the the kind of the push for more information about what's happening but but also then ensuring your kind of regulatory compliance the rules are getting more complicated you trade electronically that com regulatory compliant piece is kind of done for you you can make sure all of the you've complied with all of the rules about where this trade should be reported and the time frame and how, how all that who needs to do all that all of that can just happen for you you haven't got to worry about what all the rules are yeah and I think that sort of drives things like uh, you know, a real focus from every business in the sector, looking to reduce friction. Uh, you know, friction reduction has been a big theme. Uh, interoperability, um, you know, mode jour for you know for, for the last couple of years, and I think that's only going to develop a little bit further. So, so circling back to TradeWeb on that, what's uh, what's exciting for for the year ahead for you guys? I think that for us, uh, like we feel like we've got really good momentum in the products we have. And, and yet there's still really good opportunities. There's still our markets are still nowhere near as electronic as say equities or foreign exchange are. So we've come, mm. there's a, a long uh, runway for us to kind of grow into. At the same time, I think as, as you know, you see this kind of classic graph of electronification versus kind of products. So there are, there are still a large number of products that don't trade electronically and they need, it's not just you can, take a sort of cookie cutter and say well we have this solution they'll just stick another product in there and it'll work i think we're conscious of you need to kind of leverage what you've built and the technology and particularly the kind of integration into client systems so you can reduce the, the cost to them of new products and new trading things but also you need to make it customize it to that particular product and how that market works so that's kind of what traders trying to do as we're kind of building out a kind of multi-asset solution to kind of balance that like making it standardized enough that it's that the, the cost of deployment is as low as possible but also bespoke to how each individual product asset class or even client wants to do their business you've spoken a lot about client centricity um you know through, throughout all of this and obviously you've got a great name in, in the industry and a lot of people know about about trade web but where, where, so where does the future in terms of the, the client base look for that? Who can you continue to help? Who should be reaching out to you? What sort of companies you know, can you be helping that you're not already at the moment? What well, there's still like clients that are not trading electronically for some reason. They, they maybe the way they trade, they think is not served by the kind of current electronic trading or well, there's new things they're looking for. We'd, with those com we love those conversations. We love to kind of say, how can we take what we have to adapt that to kind of their particular needs. A, an example would be, we've seen great growth in kind of hedge funds trading more electronically. And previously they'd say, well, we didn't, we, the size we were doing was too big. And we kind of developed specific protocols to the way hedge funds want to trade. So that's kind of been like a big growth area for us. And I think there's still pockets of whether it's pockets of trades or clients that we can reach out to. We'd love to keep expanding globally China, been a big push for us the last few years. We kind of launched uh, Bong Connect, a kind of connection we have with the CFETs, which is a trading platform in China to provide access to our clients into the Chinese domestic bond market. So mm -hmm. things like, I, I think there's still a lot of those kind of global and product opportunities for us. But also I think there's, there's opportunities for us to kind of just increase automation for clients as well. They so said there's a, a load of their business there's some of their business they really need to focus and concentrate on and it's freeing up time from the other business that they can increase in the autumn the whole uh, uh, concept of china is another show altogether isn't it i mean this, the, the scale of opportunity out there is is, you know, is, is phenomenal and, and uh, i think that global growth option is just so exciting to you know to to, to hear and see toby i agree on china like the, you really have to kind of you can't just go in with like, don't worry, we know what we're doing. This is how things work. You have to kind of adapt it to like how the Chinese authorities and regulators want things to work, how the Chinese clients work. So like it, it, it is like it, it, you have to kind of shift your mentality a bit there too. And with it being a global business, I mean, look, you, you look there across Asia and, and uh, you know, Europe and across the, across the States, it, you know, it, there's, there's obviously you know, nuances to each, to each particular area. How do you shift that? How do you guys work with that to make sure that you you you, you can service the same client across all regions you know, successfully as well? 
Yes, I, I think that some of that is like people on the ground. We have to have people there so we can go and sit. And one of the, the kind of pandemic impacts of the working from home, you have to kind of adapt how the clients want to interact with you now in this new environment. But we need to kind of be, you know, like having people like who understand how individual clients in different locations operate and what they want to see and making sure then we, that has a, a, a is, is factored into how we build out new products and services. We don't just try and say, well, here's a here's our product you know you should be happy to use this it's kind of really adapting it to that simon thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing everything with us there's so much good stuff that's coming out of trade web it's been a business i've admired for a long long time and see its growth and, and everything you're doing the adaptability and and again that sort of uh, as you call it culture of collaborative innovation i love to hear i think it's so important to, to the growth and success of everything it's been great fun having you on uh, thanks for doing that and uh, and joining the show Right, thanks very much, Toby. It's a pleasure to chat to you and have a good day. Thank you very much. And we hope you have all watched it, enjoyed it watching at home. We will see you soon on another episode of FinTech Focus TV. Thanks a lot. Bye.